Dr. Yuri Felchinsky is a prominent author, historian, and journalist, an expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union. He has appeared on hundreds uh, of print, TV, and radio interviews worldwide, and is widely known as co-author of the book Blowing Up Russia with Alexander Litvinenko, a former lieutenant colonel in the FSB who was poisoned with radioactive polonium in London in 2006. His latest book, Blowing Up Ukraine, The Return of Russian Terror and the Threat of World War III, was researched before the invasion of Ukraine and is the first comprehensive investigation into the lethal methods Russia has used since 1999 to try to take over Ukraine, culminating in the full-blown unprovoked war in 2022 and mounting atrocities. Yuri, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Before we cover events in Ukraine and the culmination of a 20-year plan to try and take over the control of the country, could we please talk a little bit about the FSB's alleged involvement in a series of terrorist attacks that took place in Russia between 1994 and 1999? Because if that's true, they create a direct link between the brutality we see in Ukraine now and the very start of Putin's regime in Russia. Uh, yes, of course, and the problem is that in, in 1994, in 1999, we uh, probably did not expect that this would explode into basically, you know, Third World War uh, coming to us. Uh, in 1994, prior to the elections of President Yeltsin in 1996, uh, the first Chechen war was started. Uh, it was started as a provocation of the FSB. No one really understood why. Uh, the, the Chechens were fighting, well, not fighting actually, they had these ideas about independence, but they were never, never really fighting for it or planning to fight for it. And um, when the war started, no one really understood what was happening. Um, it's only later uh, became clear that uh, they needed the war in order to cancel or postpone elections of 96. If uh, Yeltsin, who at that point was, you know, Kremlin candidate for power, would uh, lose uh, elections to Zuganov, who was the leader of the Communist Party. Now, the first Chechen war started with uh, terrorist acts as well. There were small terrorist acts, you know, comparatively small. Several people killed uh, when a bus exploded. Somebody was trying to blow up uh, a railway uh, uh, bridge. Uh, didn't succeed, uh, killed himself. But uh, in 1994, it was militia, uh, local police. Uh, which would uh, investigate the crimes, usually all crimes in Russia. Uh, it was not the FSB. And they arrested all those involved in those terrorist acts, and all of them were from special services, all of them. Uh, they were sentenced for like two, three years minimum sentencing for something else, not for the terrorist acts, for illegal possession of weapons, for forgery documents, because the, the government, of course, claims that all those FSB and uh, whatever, GRU IDs, all well, they were, you know, fake. Uh, they were released by September of 99, by the way. In September of 99, uh, a major terrorist act happened. Uh, 300 plus people were killed. This was like 9-11 for the, for the Russians. This was the first major terrorist attack. Uh, it was claimed by the government that this was done by Chechens uh, as a retaliation for the events of which led to this first Chechen war. Uh, very quickly, the government uh, declared and started war against the Chechen Republic again. Uh, in both cases, we have to stress this was internal case of the Russian Federation. The Chechen Republic was never independent. Uh, the war again was started in case Putin, who by that time was preparing himself to become president, would 
lose elections or would look to lose elections. And so in, in order to postpone these elections or cancel them, the FSB have done the same tricks which they've done in 94, 95. Uh, organized terrorist acts first, uh, declared the war against the Chechen Republic, but surprisingly enough, uh, Putin went through elections and won. Well, it was 51% against 49. Mm. Uh, some people were saying that he was cheating and, well, and he was cheating. But uh, the result was that he won. And uh, in both cases, in 96, after Yeltsin won, and in Putin's case, war was over and war was stopped as soon as elections were, were done. Because, of course, when they fully rigged the elections, like in Lukashenko, it's like 80, 90 percent, aren't they? That's when Correct. they fully control. Correct. But you see, in case, uh, honestly, uh, to be fair, in case of Putin, uh, he he won after first round. And uh, if he would not get 50 plus uh, whatever, one vote, there, there would have to be another round, and if the another round would, would be, he uh, definitely would get more votes than the gun. I mean, this this is out of question. But Putin wanted to be elected president from the first round, and for first round they would need to cheat a little bit, so they did. Cheat. So is that Yeltsin? Or, uh, Yeltsin? Or no, no. This was this was Putin in ninety nine. Uh, right. The elections of two thousand. Um, Putin became uh, acting from prime minister, uh, acting president on thirty first of December ninety nine. But there was a lot of cheating involved. Uh, you see, uh, Putin was director of the FSB. Uh, Yeltsin had three candidates to choose from. One was Putin, who was director of the FSB. The second one was Sergei Stepashin, uh, who was former director of the FSB. And the next one was Evgeny Primakov, who was former director of SVR, Foreign Intelligence Service, uh, which is the main directorate of the KGB, the Foreign Intelligence. And so, uh, in other words, uh, by, by the end of 99, uh, Yeltsin agreed to name a former FSB uh, officer as the president of Russia. And uh, on December 31, 1999, he resigned. And by law, the prime minister, and Putin by that time already was prime minister, uh, would become acting president of Russia. And that's what happened. And Russia, this is not really a great democracy, Russia, right? It never was a democracy. Prior to 1917, it was monarchy. After 1917, prior to 1991, it was communist dictatorship. So in a country like Russia, if a person is acting president, I mean, he is actually president. And uh, all the government officials or governors, they, they all know that this is person, you know, to, to be in charge. And you better not to confront him. You better not to oppose him. So... Uh, it was a very easy uh, and programmed uh, victory for, for Putin. Uh, but this, of course, was manipulation of the system. Now, Putin became the president. Uh, many people thought that he came on behalf of the of oligarchs. And there was some truth. Uh, all oligarchs, uh, except, uh, except Gusinski, who was uh, mm. uh, actually... Uh, playing against Putin because he was helping uh, another, another group of people to come to power. Like Berezovsky. Uh, Berezovsky uh, didn't... Well, no, no, no. Berezovsky involved, actively, uh, actively, actively helped Putin. And we, we had this major conversation with him, several actually, when I tried to explain him that they should not uh, make a uh, president out of uh, lieutenant colonel of the FSB, that there, are, so there should be some other people in Russia. <laughs> it's a huge country, and they should look for some other, other uh, person and candidate. And and he replied, uh, th he was so naive, th this was even uh, frightening. Mm. He said, oh, because I, I told him that, look, Boris, if, if Putin becomes president, he will put you in prison. You will end your life in prison. Mm. And, and he said, I, I, I 
crazy? He's my friend. I know him since 91. He's my friend. My friend is becoming president of Russia. And all you want to say to me that he will put me in prison? Uh, I said, boy, that's precisely what I'm trying to explain to you. Find another candidate. They didn't. And we know how Boris ended. Mm. I mean, Primakov uh, would have been very interesting, wouldn't he? Primakov is a much more complex uh, character. Probably, probably. Mm -hmm. But uh, my point is that uh, that uh, Primakov, Stepashin, Putin had major support uh, in addition to, to Yeltsin, who would agree to see them as the next president. Mm. and would resign on 31st of December 1999, etc. They had the major structure behind them. And this structure was the, the FSB, the state security, the former KGB. And that's why I never look at uh, Putin as if he is a dictator similar to Lukashenko. Mm. Right? Uh, because uh, Lukashenko is a classical dictator. I mean, if you take him out tomorrow, then uh, Belarus would become a normal country the day after tomorrow. This is not so with Russia, and I do not believe even now that if you somehow get rid of Putin, then uh, you will uh, get rid of all problems which we have with uh, Russia, uh, not necessarily, and I'm quite sure that this would not be the case, that this problem is much bigger. And the problem is the state security. The state security, which was fighting for power, believe it or not, since December of 1917, when it was formed. And there is a very bloody history of relationship between party and state security, because party needed state security, because they needed them you know, to fight against all enemies. And for the Soviet government, uh, everybody, uh, or, uh, you know, everybody around was the enemy except the Communist Party itself. So they needed they needed this powerful uh, structure to, in, in, you know, institution tool to fight all these enemies, both inside and outside. But at the same time, they knew that the, uh, the you know, current FSB, former NKVD, KGB, whatever, they were fighting for power because they wanted to have uh, absolute power in the state without any political control. And this bloody history, and the, this history was very bloody, a state security uh, personnel uh, was the most dangerous job in the Soviet Union. Dozens of thousands of high-ranking uh, state security officers were executed by the Communist Party. The last executions ended in 56. In 56, there was an agreement that they do not kill each other anymore. Mm -hmm. There were times when state security would get initiatives in, in their hands and they, they will, then they will start to kill party officials. So this this relation, they were very bloody. And, uh, but, but the goal was always the same, to reach uh, a level of absolute control in the state, in the Soviet Union. Uh, for the first time, uh, they came close to this uh, ideal goal. Uh, when Andropov, former KGB uh, chairman, became first general secretary of the Communist Party and then uh, chairman of the Supreme Soviet uh, of the Soviet Union, he actually became president. But Andropov ruled just one and a half years. He died. And uh, the, the KGB lost initiative. The Communist Party, of course, took control as well. It's ended with Gorbachev and his reforms. Uh, the KGB like, hated him very much. They wanted to get rid of him in August of 91. They tried. They failed. It backfired. The Soviet Union collapsed. But it collapsed not because of reforms of Gorbachev. It collapsed because in August of 91, hardliners uh, in charge of them was chairman of KGB, Vladimir Kuchkov, 
was trying to return Russia, this reformed Russia, which had free elections for the first time, absolute freedom of press, market economy, which started to develop, open borders, which were never opened. This, this all happened under Gorbachev. And, and prior to this particular day when, when coup d'etat happened, you know, Soviet Union still was the most uh, probably free, free uh, country, you know, in, in its own history. Uh, but uh, coup d'etat failed and Yeltsin came to power. And it seems to be that Russia was becoming a normal democratic country. The problem was that there was one institution which was not touched by August 91 revolution. This was the only institution which survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. There were no other Soviet institutions which survived mm -hmm. this collapse. And this institution was the, the, the KGB. And uh, since 91, uh, there were several attempts to take power. Uh, we, we know when those attempts were made. One was October 93, when a communist uh, parliament, uh, which was infiltrated heavily by KGB personnel, uh, was trying to, you know, overthrow Yeltsin, basically force him to resign. Uh, they failed. In March of 96, uh, when elections were planned to, to be conducted in Russia and uh, Alexander Korzhakov, the, the person who was responsible for security, personal security of uh, Yeltsin and who was in charge for practical purposes of the uh, state security, uh, was trying to force Yeltsin to cancel elections, postpone elections. And the idea was, believe it or not, it's difficult to prove, of course, but the idea was that somehow Yeltsin would die very quickly. And another person, Alexis Kavets, who was already prepared, who had a position created for him, vice president, kind of first vice premier of Russia. Mm -hmm. this was Time when, when they had this position, he's, he's, he was the man who would uh, replace Yeltsin in case something happens to him. Mm. Uh, they failed because Yeltsin, who had great intuition for power, I believe, uh, fired Korzhakov and uh, you know took the side of oligarchs who were offering uh, you know to conduct quote unquote free elections. Uh, so Yeltsin uh, won over Zyuganov with minority votes uh, from the second round. Uh, some people were saying that he was cheating, and he was cheating. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there is nothing what you could do. He won. And uh, and then the third attempt, of course, uh, was 99, 2000. So in, in a historically very short period of time, because we have to agree from that from August of 91 to uh, December of 99, when Putin became uh, acting president mm -hmm. and, and in 2000, in early 2000 president, it's, this is historically a very, very short period. So in during this you know, less than 10 years period, uh, the, the FSB finally uh, mm. reached its objective. They put their person as president of Russia, very quickly took control of the entire country because Putin immediately started to promote to major government and political positions as the FSB officers. We have to know and to remember that in addition to all those, you know, KGB FSB officers who were openly working, you know, as serving the country as state security officers, uh, there was so-called uh, group, of, of, it's, it's called Officers of Active Reserve. Uh, basically, this is a system when a person who once started to work for the FSB, KGB, uh, never leaves the, the department, but is sent to work in, in, in civil, as civil servant. Right? In other words, they, they 
they were sending KGB officers uh, into peaceful uh, yeah. Soviet first and then Russian you know, country as if they were sending spies abroad, as if they were sending illegals abroad. So it's like, well, when Putin was working in Dresden, for example, he mm. was not there as a KGB officer. He was there as a director of uh, Soviet German society, French mm -hmm. society, like this, right? So he had a different position, right? But indeed, of course, he was KGB officer. And they were doing the same inside Russia. So they would send those people, and uh, usually, of course, they were trying to take uh, the, the, the best position, the highest position possible in the newspapers, in mm. the uh, organizations, you know, in publishing houses, in banks, in all those major companies which deal with oil. And, and of course, Putin worked in Sobchak's uh, mayor's office, right. didn't he? So Anatoly Precisely. Sobchak. You know. Precisely. And, and actually, this uh, so-called democratic revolution, uh, unfortunately so-called, because uh, we hoped that Russia would become a, a democracy. But literally, I, I have uh, two, two photos uh, which are well known and which I think demonstrate that the, the August Revolution of 91 had no chances to, to win. Because in the first moment, in the first day of this revolution, when Yeltsin was giving his major first speech uh, of, you know, on, from a tank, uh, Alexander Kozhakov already was near him. And the second person who was already near him uh, was uh, uh, Zotov, right? Zolotov. Mm. And Zolotov actually later become uh, chief of uh, secret service for uh, Putin. And uh, of course, he's in charge of Rosgvardia uh, now. Yeah. And the same day, uh, Sabchak was giving similar speech in St. Petersburg. And there was a person behind him. And that person was Vladimir Putin. My point is that revolution just started, but all those people were already positioned to the high level Democrats. Uh, there mm -hmm. were not too many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the chief of the secret service for uh, Igor Gaidar, the first Russian democratic prime minister, was Andrei Lugavoy, who later, of course, became known as the person who killed Alexander Litvinenko. And uh, we may continue, you know, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this description of, of these particular stories. But my point is that in every structure, you will, you would find a KGB, higher ranking KGB officer already positioned, mm. controlling the situation. Uh, Vladimir Gusinski, a major Russian oligarch who owned uh, NTV and had major media empire, media, media most group. Media most group, group, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, he was working for Philip uh, Babkov. Philip Babkov was KGB, full, full KGB general, first deputy of Yuri Andropov. That's how it was. So, uh, democracy never had a chance in Russia because in order to have this chance, the KGB uh, should be dissolved. Mm. And this was never done. And the same problem we have now, and this problem is serious, especially if we take into account uh, you know, the war with Ukraine, which began in 2014 as a kind of you know, low-level war and became a full-scale war mm. now in February. But the problem is that uh, to get rid of Putin is, is not enough. This is not just Putin alone. He is not alone at all. Uh, it's the entire institution of the FSB, uh, which is a very serious structure, which is uh, more than 100 years old now. That this is the only structure which is, you know, uh, more than 100 years old. In Russia, everything else died and collapsed. And uh, unless unless we find the way 
to to dissolve them somehow and to ban them and uh, without allowing them to 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 be reborn uh, uh, under new abbreviation because all they were doing you do not trust me they were many many times you know this probably they were changing the name i mean from 1970 yes. until recently checker ogpu there's so many born, different names yes constantly changing yes. names uh and uh there are certain reasons for this uh, because they were regrouping, they were restructuring, the Communist Party didn't really know what to do with them, how to make them not dangerous for the mm. Communist Party. But the result is that for the first time in human history, we have a state, a major state, a nuclear state, which is uh, ruled by the state security. Yeah. It's first in uh, history, isn't it? I mean, it's the first time it's this comprehensive, yeah. I mean, this is the first time. You will never find an example where where a country is ruled by the state security. You mm. will find monarchs or dictators or, or hunters or political parties, mm. but, but not the state security. Mm. In the Soviet Union, uh, this was the state security under political control of the Communist Party. And that's why, of course, the state security mm. wanted to get rid of this political control, because they always had this belief that the only reason the Soviet Union is not winning this war against the United States and against the West is because they have this political control of this stupid Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they, as soon as they would get rid of this political control, then they know how to win. And that's why we, we see what we see now. We actually see the first attempt of the state security of the Russian Federation finally, you know, to be released from any political control from the top mm. and finally starting to you know, realize, to fulfill their ideas and the, the program which they have. That program is very simple. Uh, they uh, they plan to to rule the world. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to believe because Russia is a huge country. Nevertheless, it's just one country. But but they sincerely believe that through through blood, through force, uh, starting with Europe, they would end uh, to control to rule in Europe first. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, to force even the United States to agree that they are number two and not number one. And of course, and we then, we want to defend our values. We we uh, want democracy to be the system that triumphs, uh, not the, the Kremlin's template for control. And we assume that they understand that democracy is a real thing. Uh, and they have this vision they're fighting one system against another. But actually, that's not how Putin thinks, is it? He doesn't actually believe there's such a thing as organic democracy. He doesn't believe there's such a thing as genuine opposition. It seems in his mindset, everything's a plot. Everything's a power play. It seems to be ultra cynical. You know, since 2000, uh, Putin, as president of Russia, obliged to, to uh, address nation with, uh, you know, particular speech right I, I mean this is usually done in all states you we have it in the united states we have it in britain uh so putin has his momentum as well so once once a year he's giving this major speech to 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 russian people uh the word democracy was used once in all the speeches yeah. uh during all these years the word democracy what use once I, I even do not remember it what uh, what mm. was the context but uh no Putin doesn't uh, believe in democracy this is not surprising for us we kind of understand this but uh our hope was and this was the basis I guess for all our mistakes uh, our hope was that he is a practical rash rational man uh, we were actually thinking and hoping that he's also corrupt, 
that he is interested in money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the person is interested in money, uh, it's it's easy to deal with him. You mm. always would be able to buy him. This was, by the way, what we discussed with Berezovsky as well. He told me that why why should I be afraid of Putin? I I will buy him. I I have money. We have money. Well, he was talking about oligarchs, right? We mm. have money. We will buy all of them. And I told him Boris. They will take your money. They do not want you to give them money. They will take your money. So uh, we were hoping that uh, Putin is a corrupt politician uh, who likes, you know, yachts, mm -hmm. uh, being abroad and traveling abroad and sending his children abroad and living abroad part of his life. Well, probably this does not uh, relate to Putin. He's the president. It's a particular job. But all other people around him, as we mm. know, right, they were buying property abroad. They were sending their children to study abroad. They were sending their families to live yeah. abroad. Uh, they were having yachts and planes and a lot of money. And, uh, you know, we were kind of hoping that this is the price which we are paying uh, for peace, mm. right? That they, they would not dare to, to destroy everything because basically they are destroying their own style of life, which they like very much. And they did. Until until the, the decision mm. was made that it's time to start, mm. and the decision was made. I I think in two thousand six, the, there was a, the first speech in two thousand six, which Putin gave, kind of informal speech uh, to the, uh, I think it was International Economic uh, Summit in Saint Petersburg, something mm -hmm. like this. There, there were leaders of states, uh, and. He addressed them saying something like, well, look, you, you need to agree that we have to control, uh, you know, just just four republics, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Tajikistan, uh, Kazakhstan, and, and, and uh, something else, I forgot, and uh, Moldova, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the rest you you could have, but this this republic say, should should be ours. And no one actually protested. People like kind of you know, well, okay, all right. didn't take him seriously. All right, yeah. Vladimir. Yeah, all yeah. right, Vladimir. Okay, of course. Mm -hmm. But then in two thousand seven, he uh, gave that Munich speech mm -hmm. uh, about uh, you know nostalgia for the Soviet Union and. Uh, he then started to mention that this was a major personal tragedy for him and major geopolitical catastrophe for Russia and for Russian people. And then he, he invaded Georgia, mm. right? And after the invasion of Georgia, nothing happened, honestly. I, I guess people have difficulties to find Georgia on the map. Uh, even more difficult for them, it was to find uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia on the map and to understand the nature of problems and conflicts. Uh, so there were no sanctions and, and nothing at all. And uh, Putin, this was a moment when he knew that he's allowed to do what he wants. And then, of course, 2014 started. In 2014, uh, started probably unexpectedly for him because he did not expect Yanukovych to lose power. This was all Putin's fault. Uh, we have to to be fair. Uh, he he forced Yanukovych to take back his word, which he mm -hmm. gave to his country, that uh, his country would try would do everything to become part of European Union. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. there, is a, there is a reason why Ukrainians wanted to be part of European Union. They didn't have to, they did not want to have, you know, visas traveling to, to Europe. They wanted to have uh, ability to work in Europe. I mean, the, everybody in Ukraine was seriously interested in Ukraine. 
have been members of European Union. They wanted European Union to help them to rebuild the economy, uh, to finance the economy in Ukraine in forms of loans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Move away from oligarchy into more of a pluralistic right. kind but this, of economy. This probably, yeah. no, probably oligarchs themselves in Ukraine didn't want really Ukraine to get rid of them, mm -hmm. but and they had some control. But nevertheless, everybody was interested in in being a member of European Union. And uh, and that's what uh, Yanukovych promised. I mean, there this, were this serious conversations and discussions about this, and he made certain statements. And then, of course, Putin forced him to take back his word in exchange, uh, in, in return for $15 billion loan to, mm. to Ukraine. And that's when the revolution started. So it was provoked by Putin. Uh, so uh, Putin, at the end, uh, decided to 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 invade Ukraine. Right? He he lost Yanukovych. Uh, he lost the ability to install pro-Russian government uh, because prior to this, it was always 50-50. We remember how Yanukovych was fighting against Yushchenko. Mm -hmm. And it was like so closed every time that the Supreme Court of Ukraine would have to intervene. Uh, but uh, but uh, when Yanukovych lost power, this was the moment when it became clear that Ukrainians would never choose a pro-Russian candidate mm -hmm. again. And this was the moment when Putin decided that it's time to, to start to deal with Ukraine. Now, the idea was very simple, that he would invade Crimea, take it uh, quickly. This was easy because the, the Black Fleet uh, has a major uh, base in Sevastopol. So Russian troops are already there. Mm. They would not need to, to move them to, uh, to transfer them from different parts of Russia. They were already there. And Ukrainians, this is very important to understand, Ukrainians did not have army at all. No. Why, do they, you know, why, why do they need an army who is going to invade them? Russia? Ha, ha, ha. That's what happened with Crimea. Because there was a treaty in place, wasn't there, in order to denuclearize? Of course. Uh, of course. There was a treaty, there were guarantees. Guarantees, uh, yeah, provided by Britain, yes. US, Russia, absolutely. Even China, yeah. uh, I believe. Uh, so Ukraine was safe as mm -hmm. insurance company. And uh, and then, of course, Crimea happened. And then as soon as Crimea happened, and uh, Ukrainians made a mistake. They should fight for Crimea. They didn't. This was a major mistake. Uh, and then, of course, Putin saw that, well, if this is so easy, should I try to take more? And he started the invasion of uh, Donbass. Uh, this was done through so-called uh, referendum. Again, uh, Ukraine is a country with 50-50 split um, prior to 19, mm. uh, 2014. Uh, half of population, Russian-speaking population, actually feel probably more Russian than Ukrainian. Another one, another half is kind of more Ukrainian than mm. Russian. Uh, there were some Western Ukrainian parts, which are uh, literally like 100% Ukrainian, probably mm. not necessarily even speak Russian. But, uh, uh, but mainly it was a mixed uh, population, but the closer to Russia, uh, you will have, of course, more and more percentage of Russians living there. So the areas uh, along the Russian border, uh, they were all you know, inhibited by, by Russians. Uh, and, uh, well, yes, some of them were probably felt that they closed uh, closer to Russia than to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it was very easy to uh, provoke uh, those, uh, you know, people to, to start to demand referendums. Mm. And this was the, the idea after Crimea, that you will... Uh, you will start this separate movement, uh, which was uh, actually effectively organized by Russian special forces. They are really very good in this. Because uh, I was going to say, there wasn't an organic, ground-up separatist movement, and the Western press still get this wrong in articles all the time. Um, 
it, they, they engineered essentially Correct. that resistance movement. And 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 again, this we've seen this in Georgia, right? Uh, where this was successfully done by Russians. Even now, Western analysts are not able to understand really what was happening there, mm -hmm. who was who started to fight, who was killing whom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? And basically, they start to do the same in in Ukraine. Now we, uh, it's a, uh, it's a tricky, it's a tricky uh, part. But you know, Soviet special forces and Russian special forces, uh, they were good in organizing uh, partisan uh, movement and revolts in in places like Africa. Mm. Trust me, it's much easier uh, to organize it in Ukraine when you speak uh, your native language and you look actually similar to the local mm. population. But uh, the, the, the but GRU has specially trained military units whose profession is to uh, organize disturbances, again, in places like uh, Africa or Latin America. Mm. So trust me, it was very easy to do the same in, in Ukraine. And uh, the famous person, Yurkin, who is outspoken now as a hardliner, you know, was yeah. demanded that um, general mobilization, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from day number one. Uh, he was one of those people who organized this, uh, this quote-unquote uh, revolt or separatist movement. And Ukrainians who do not have army by that time at all were avoiding the, the, the word war. They mm. they never stated that they can they considering what's happening in 2014 is an open aggression of Russia against this, against the Ukraine. This was never said. This was another mistake by Ukrainians, mm. and because of this, the entire world thought, well, basically, if Ukrainians are not saying that this is a war, why should we say mm -hmm. that this is a war? Now let's wait and see. And that's what we were doing from 2014 to 2022. There was fighting for Donbass all these years. Uh, there were probably 10 to 12,000 people killed from each side uh, during this eight years fighting for Donbass. But the reality was that Russians could not proceed further and Ukrainians could not really take these territories unless they really go into full-scale uh, war against uh, Russia. And they didn't want to do this for obvious reasons. So this was a frozen conflict. Mm. This is an interesting point, point, because in the current war, in the current invasion, Putin still seems to have assumed that the local population will be either indifferent or in some ways, you know, side with his army, you know, uh, you know, greet them on the streets. He's got this catastrophically wrong, hasn't he? Um, and to an extent, we can see the retribution that he has inflicted on Mariupol and Kharkiv. Is this a retribution because they, they didn't embrace him? They didn't just fall over and let his armies conquer them. They resisted. And the irony is, uh, tragic irony, uh, that both Kharkov and Mariupol are 100% Russian. 100%, yeah. Uh, like 100%. No, no, I mean, not 99, probably like 100%. Mm. Kharkov was considered to be a Russian capital of Ukraine. Uh, the, when the Soviet army, Russian Red Army, was trying to install the first Soviet government uh, in Ukraine, the, the Kharkov was capital and it was installed in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, Stalin moved to Kharkov, uh, which became a major industrial city. Russian workers, really Russian workers from mm -hmm. from Russian, from Russia, from Russian part of the Soviet Union. So Kharkov was uh, a Russian city. The same uh, was true about Mariupol. And this is, uh, there is an irony that uh, Putin destroyed uh, not Lvov, which is, you know, 
very much Ukrainian city, mm. but but Kharkov and, and uh, trying to destroy Kharkov, not yeah. destroyed, not yet at least, or probably by now it's it's over. But uh, Mariupol was destroyed. The idea was very simple, and this is also very interesting and very typical of uh, Putin. The idea was that they, uh, you know, the separatist movement didn't work. I mean, Donbass story would not work in 2022. So what he'd done is the following. He concentrated like whatever, 150, 120, 200,000, doesn't matter, a strong army uh, along the border. He quietly took Belarus in 21. This is mm. very interesting because he took Belarus so quietly that no one actually noticed this. Mm. And uh, so the troops were now concentrated along the Ukrainian border, not just from, from the Russian territory, but also from, from Belarus. What is important, because if you want to attack Kiev, you need to go from Belarus. There is no way you would do it through, through Russia. It's just too far, too far. Uh, and uh, the idea was that they will take uh, Ukraine very quickly. They will take Kiev very quickly either kill Zelensky or arrest Zelensky or force him to escape, uh, install the old government. Uh, Yanukovych was already moved to, to Minsk. He was waiting for quote-unquote invitation to come to, in, to proclaim himself as the, the lawful president again. And uh, then the idea was, believe it or not, that they will uh, use the Ukrainian army and the Russian army, uh, combine it with the Russian army, and invent into Eastern Europe, probably starting with the Baltic states, of course. This plan failed. Uh, it failed when, when Russians could not uh, take Kiev. And after six months, well, now tomorrow it's going to be seven months, by mm. the way, after seven months of war, uh, the picture changed completely. Mm -hmm. Not only the second army in the world, which is Russian army, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's not uh, capable to take even Ukraine. Not speaking about uh, using this army to advance into Eastern uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and this so far is a good Part, mm. Right. I mean, this is great that the Ukrainians are holding, that the whole world is united in, in helping Ukrainians. Uh, uh, I see one problem which is serious. Uh, Ukrainians are not getting enough weapons. Uh, there might be some reasons for this. Some of them might be objective. Uh, in any case, those weapons are very expensive. Uh, but but the second problem has nothing to do with with money. Ukrainians are getting these weapons under conditions that they are not using it against Russia or Belarus. And if you if you think about this, you understand that Ukrainians are placed in a situation when they are not able to win the war yeah. because you cannot win the war. If you are not allowed to to attack enemy territory, where troops are regrouped or concentrated, or rockets or, fired, I mean, Belgrade, rockets, uh, precisely, yeah. or rockets fired from uh, from Belarus, by mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. or artillery shells are coming along the Russian border because Russian artillery uh, could hit uh, targets in twenty five kilometer distance, mm -hmm. so. They are safely positioned inside Russia, and they're just shelling, you know, to to Ukraine. And Ukrainians are not allowed to retaliate. Mm. And in fact, to force, to force Putin or whoever replaces him to agree to a stable peace, isn't it also the case that uh, Ukraine would have to actively occupy? Some, some fairly major chunks of Russian territory in the east, Belgorod and some of the border um, towns, and then they could negotiate uh, a withdrawal from those areas to create a stable peace. A little bit like Israel, you know, conquering the, the Sinai uh, and, and forcing, you know, Egypt to uh, to come to genuine peace talks. 
Well, the strategy in general uh, have to be the, the Israeli one. I actually mm -hmm. was saying a couple of times that in order to win, uh, Ukrainians have to start to think as, as Israelis. Mm. But uh, I, I would not, I, I do not really think it's really necessary to occupy Belgrade, to, but to but to fire there uh, is absolutely necessary because yes. that's where the, one of the main bases uh, is. But um, it's uh, it's interesting how the war changed the, the situation. I mean, if we from twenty fourth of February, February everything is different now, right? The, Putin was fighting against NATO, uh, you know, increasing the members membership, I mean, countries who, who joined NATO. The result is that Finland and Sweden joined NATO. Putin was fighting for Russian language to be respected in Ukraine. The result is that even Russians do not uh, speak uh, Russian in Ukraine now. Uh, the, the Russian army is uh, destroyed. Uh, now they're forced to conduct uh, mobilization. Uh, the, the way they conducted if, if you've seen the pictures uh, and and there are I am sure there are much more of them to see uh, is is absolutely ugly uh, mm. it's, it's not an, an orderly event which is you know where you just ask people by mail to to come to serve or, well it's you know, it's to, uh... to make you to to you know to uh to fulfill your duties no but I mean, this is not, this is not new is it uh, I mean, I was in St. Petersburg in the 1990s and I saw people dragged out of the metro, dragged off trains, taken to military bases for training. Just any time of the day, uh, if you're a young man, you were at risk of, of basically being kidnapped by the state. Um, so this isn't a new behavior, is it? Well, it's uh, it's I would say it's kind of new. Uh, you see... We know that Stalin, for example, uh, put uh, all those prisoners, uh, former prisoners of war who were coming back from German concentration camps, he put them in prison, right? Mm. I mean, he considered them people to commit in treason and put them in, in labor camps in, mm. in Russia. But there was no law which would allow uh, the government to do this. I mean, Stalin done this because he was a dictator. Uh, uh, Putin in, now introduced a law when you are considered to be a person committing treason if you are taken prisoner. <laughs> this mm. is something, uh, abs uh, I mean, this is new. Uh, Stalin was uh, releasing prisoners uh, from uh, labor camps to send them to front, to front during the, the you know, uh, after German invasion of, of Russia. But mainly, these were political prisoners. Yes. Uh, yes. Stalin, of course, uh, the majority of those people in, in camps were political prisoners. Uh, Putin is releasing uh, real criminals to be sent to, yeah. to fight yeah. uh, in Ukraine. I mean, this is so ugly. This is so unlawful. Uh, no one pretends anymore that there is a law is a uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, a person who is no one knows who is he for for Putin. Or some some people are saying that he's his cook. Fine, he's coming, but he's like nobody. All right, he's servant, government official, whatever mm. he is, he's coming to all these uh, concentration camps and promising all those prisoners that after six months of fighting they they will be pardoned by the government i mean he has no authority to do this yeah. he has no authority to take people out of the prison or out of the labor camp i mean this is supposed to be done by law uh by so some paperwork etc i mean Everything <laughs> what's happening now in Russia is absolutely crazy. This would be a laughing story if this would be mm. not uh, so so sad and dangerous. The referendums which they are going to conduct now on September whatever 23, 27 in all those occupied uh, areas. Number one, not even 
those some of those areas are not even occupied, like Kherson, for example. It, it's it's not really under Russian control, not entirely. Uh, those referendums uh, have no value at all. He he could conduct referendum in Alaska the same way, claiming that Alaska should belong to to the Russian Federation. Uh, this is all ridiculous, but but that's what's happening because this is unfortunately is the beginning of the program, mm. of Putin, not the end of this. And uh, when I was saying that the the uh, the situation is actually much brighter now, well, except that Ukrainians are paying price for for uh, for this, uh, you know, six months. Uh, break or seven months break which we have uh the, the problem is of course that putin has nuclear weapons and uh is he going to use it i think the answer is yes and i think the way he's going to use it uh is to fire from belarus not from the russian federation because i i do not think that he is so stupid that he would fire from, from the territory of the Russian Federation. And I believe that the only reason he's not annexing Belarus uh, is to keep it formally independent. So he would fire from Belarus. But and he controls that thought, infrastructure oh, yes, entirely. Oh, yes, yeah. oh, yes. Oh, yes. He controls Belarus like entirely. And he controls Lukashenko entirely. And Lukashenko is not an independent mm. uh, leader or dictator at all. Uh, but uh, I think he's uh, keeping uh, Belarus independent, so he would fire from Belarus. And then retaliation, whatever this could be, and it's questionable whether it could be a nuclear retaliation, because Belarus is a small country, deeply inside Europe, radiation could go you know, beyond the borders. So, all right, yes, you probably would deal with Belarus differently, but uh, I think that's what the danger is. Mm. I think that's what we should expect uh, next. Uh, uh, be behind the, besides the fact that, uh, well, he is hoping, of course, to to arm those three hundred thousand or whatever mm. he's going to mobilize. There is a secret uh, number seven clause in the law which he published, which was not published. That indeed uh, it's not going to be three hundred thousand; it's going to be one million. And but they, even uh, they lie even about casualties. Uh, there's no reason oh, yes. why they wouldn't lie about the number of troops. They, right, right, yeah. right. So, but even if we are talking about three hundred thousand, three hundred thousand is an interesting figure. Is, is this is approximately twice as much as Russia lost? And I do not want to say that Russia, you know, hundred fifty thousand Russians were killed in Ukraine. Mm. This is not the case. But uh, for everybody who is killed. You have probably three wounded, then there are some people who are defected mm -hmm. or deserted, some people who were taken prisoners. Basically, the first echelon which entered Ukraine is gone. So 300,000 is, first of all, like twice as much as Putin had before. But it's also 300,000 corresponds to the amount of troops which NATO promised to have as a quick reaction force. So if you look at the last NATO summit, they are increasing quick reaction, so-called quick reaction force in Europe from 40,000 to mm, 300. 300. So Putin, I guess, is trying to match this 300,000 of quick reaction force in Europe. Uh, my, my point is that we are just in the beginning of our problems. This is not the end. We are not even in the middle. Um, we sincerely hope that this somehow ends quickly, uh, but I do not really see how this might end quickly. I think we, we, we will go a very long road before before it would end. And I know you've got another interview to go to, but to, to summarize on that pessimistic note, even if Ukraine is victorious, and we hope it is, that still doesn't solve the problem of the FSB elite, the sort of KGB elite that control now every aspect of Russian society, politics, and economics and wealth. I mean, that doesn't even begin to solve that problem. 
Correct. For this, uh, Russia had to be defeated on a level Germany was defeated in 45. Difficult to imagine. Yuri, I know you have to rush. Thank you so much for this interview. Uh, it's incredibly insightful and a real privilege to be able to speak to you about these terrifying events. Thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you.